<laughs> All righty. All right, guys, I'll ask you to mute. I will keep admitting um, people as they come. I apologize for last week's snafu, but um, it was kind of a blessing to disguise. I got locked out of the Zoom account um, after numerous tries, but I had also just been released from the hospital that day. So it was probably a, a good thing for me. So I was able to get, get to bed early. Um, so Ted will take it over uh, momentarily. Don't forget, we have a called shot lunch next week on the 20th. Um, that's midday. Um, and for those who don't know, the Baltimore baseball book that's coming out in conjunction with the convention should be, Saber should be announcing it in the next week or so. It's already on Amazon. Um, but uh, Saber should make a formal announcement and we will likely have a launch um, at the Babe Ruth birthplace in, uh, in mid-November where copies will be available. So um, without further ado, I will let Ted take over. He has co-host um, capabilities and hopefully he'll wow us uh, as he always has in the past. So thank you, Ted, and we'll talk to you at the end. Okay, thank you. Uh, first to check, everyone can see my PowerPoint, I hope. Yes. Good. Yes, that's good. Okay. All right. Thanks for the invite. It's good to be in Baltimore, even if via Zoom. Looking forward to next summer when I'll be there with all of you live. Uh, my topic today is last December's major league announcement that they were going to designate the Negro Leagues as an additional uh, major league. I hope to cover the current status of that announcement and speak a little bit about some future related happenings. What I won't be doing is breaking any new news because uh, the folks have been pretty tight-lipped about this, but I'm very confident that uh, Major League Baseball, Elias Sports Bureau, Seam Heads, and Baseball Reference, and who knows who else, are hard at work on the, on the issue. Okay, baseball, of course, as everyone in Saber knows, is a sport of history and celebrating its past. In 1939, uh, baseball celebrated the centennial of baseball, literally the, the celebration of the invention of the game itself. Uh, now, I'm not going to get into that whatever happened in 1839. I'm not sure what it was, but I do know that uh, the among the centennial of events was the opening of the Baseball Hall of Fame, which, of course, is still with us today. And uh, the first 16 players had been put in by 1939. No Negro Leaguers were in that bunch. And uh, that is the fault of the Hall, but it's more a fault of the major leagues, because up until that time and pretty much until 1971, no player got in the hall that wasn't a major league player. 30 years later, uh, Major League Baseball celebrated an, another centennial. Uh, this one was the centennial of professional baseball, and at least this one was based on a little bit more authentic history, although even this uh, is debatable. I, I very much doubt that the Cincinnati Red Stockings of 1869 were the first professional team. They certainly weren't the first professional players. One of the uh, products of that centennial was the publication of the baseball encyclopedia, the Big Mac. And in order to get that published, there had to be some agreement as to what leagues were indeed major leagues. Uh, so in 1968, Major League Baseball, Commissioner Eckert appointed a five-person panel to make that determination, among other things. And they looked at seven leagues, uh, and you can see them listed here chronologically. And they did come to the determination that the National Association from 1871 to 1875 was indeed the first professional league, but they didn't feel it had a uh, sufficient schedule or procedures to be considered a major league. The other six, though, got the, the 
wave on, uh, the oldest of which, of course, is the National League, founded in 1876 and still with us. The second oldest is the American League, and th these are the only two that are still in existence. The other four had fairly short lives, but the American Association of 1882 had 10 years, the Union Association and the Players League one year each, and finally the Federal League in 1914 had a two-year existence. Well, I was given the opportunity in 19 in 2017 to question two of the people who, who knew best about that circumstance in 1969. One was David Neft, who was probably in the room for many of those decisions. He was the editor of the Big Mac and, uh, you know, one of the main people responsible for that, the existence of that, that journal. The other was John Thorne, the historian of baseball uh, today, and I guess he's been that for about six or seven years. And I sort of sheepishly and somewhat arrogantly, I must confess, I asked the following question of those two. I, I, I said, I prefaced it by saying, uh, I would like, after you give me the one word answer, could you please elaborate a bit? And here's the question. In 1969, were the Negro Leagues even considered by the Special Baseball Records Committee to be a major league? The National Association had at least been considered and denied. Of course, the answer came back quick, no. But John was nice enough to elaborate here. And he said, the same criteria used to disqualify the National Association as a major league would surely apply to the Negro Leagues. He also said, Major League Baseball will never incorporate the, the records of the Pittsburgh Crawfords because they never played any other team in what is determined to be Major League Baseball. Those statements were true at the time. And as a good historian, they were the only answers that, that John could give. Here comes another centennial in 2020. It promised to be a good year. Uh, and we were going to celebrate the 100th anniversary of the creation of the Negro Leagues. Uh, the Negro League Baseball Museum, in concert with a couple other uh, folks, named a Negro League Centennial Team, a 32-person team to honor the greatest players in Negro League history. The right fielder on that team is Rap Dixon. Okay. Also in 2020, real early in the year, the book, The Negro Leagues Were Major Leagues, was published by McFarland, uh, edited by Todd Peterson, and I was privileged to write a chapter in that book. Let's take a quick look at 2020 and, and see what happened to derail our centennial celebration. Uh, it was uh, planned to be all year long, and there were events happening every month. And some of them actually did occur, but they ended up being virtual, much like this meeting. In uh, January, that book was published, and I like to think it had some effect on the decision that's my topic tonight. Uh, but then in January, there was a confirmed case of a worldwide pandemic. In February, on the last day of the year, or the month, there was a confirmed death in the state of Washington. My birthday is St. Patrick's Day. And uh, on the day before, Governor Wolf of Pennsylvania probably saved countless lives because he shut the restaurants and the bars down 24 hours before I was going to have my 49th consecutive pub crawl. But it was for the best. In May, things turned to the worst when George Floyd was killed on videotape uh, brutally by the police uh, in Minneapolis. You'll notice these events that are highlighted in red, I feel had some effect on the decision that Major League Baseball made. Three months later, Ben Lindbergh talking to Major League Baseball, so this was not a gotcha headline, but he published an article in The Ringer, and the headline was, 
Major League Baseball may undo a major mistake. And given the circumstances of 2020 with both the pandemic and social justice moving to the forefront, that kind of headline had to be followed up with action and positive action. Now, the timing was a mystery. But after the publication of that article, I felt pretty good about the chances of the Negro Leagues being recognized to a greater degree than they ever had before. The pandemic, however, continued. The early baseball era committee that we were speaking of before we began the night, they were supposed to vote in December in, in considering even Negro Leaguers. Unfortunately, that was postponed till December of this year. The baseball winter meetings went virtual and by November 3rd, 232,000 Americans had succumbed to the coronavirus, COVID-19. Now, here's where I take great liberty because the last of the five events that affect the decision, the December decision by Major League Baseball, I probably give, give Sabre a little more credit because on December 15th, Sabre announced a Negro Leagues task force to sort of follow up on, on Lindbergh's article and just to, you know, see what, if anything, should be done with the status of the Negro Leagues. Hence the title of my presentation. I call it the morning after. The morning after December 15th at uh, Major League Baseball made a great and, and breathtaking for me, uh, I rank it next to 1947 as, as the best decision baseball ever made. Uh, they officially, officially designated the Negro Leagues as a major league. Uh, now, there was some limited criticism about that, and we can get into that if you like in, in Q&A. Uh, I don't see a need. In attendance at that press conference, which was really strictly virtual and actually just a, a press release, were these four individuals. Commissioner Manfred, who deserves the lion's share of the credit, he was the man who had to pull the trigger. John Thorne, the official historian of baseball, I, I, I detect his fingerprints all over the, uh, the decision. Bob Kendrick the president of the Negro Leagues Baseball Museum. He also spoke and was quoted in the press release. And finally, the, the most unknown of these names, John LaBombarda, who is the head of the editorial department of Elias Sports Bureau. He was brought in because of the second announcement that was to be made. There were three announcements made that day. I'm gonna warn you right now. The first two actually were made and the third is heard by only a few people. I don't know if I'm lucky or not, but I heard it loud and clear. And we're going to talk about all three. Uh, oh, and I forgot to ask you, and I'd appreciate it if you type in your guess, who's missing from these four people? Who should have been at this press conference? Uh, and they weren't. Uh, so let me move along and I may give you a clue in this screen. Uh, in the press release, they did mention the National Baseball Hall of Fame on, on two occasions. And most notably, they credited the wonderful 2006 study by the Negro Leagues Researchers and Authors Group featuring Larry Lester and Dick Clark. They also mentioned seam heads. They didn't have a speaking role, but uh, Gary Ashwell, Scott Simkus, Kevin Johnson, Mike Lynch, once again, Larry Lester, the late Dick Clark, Wayne Stivers, and Patrick Rock, the leading contributors to that magnificent database were also mentioned. And finally, and I did notice a few people here, there's only 12 people in the room, but two or three of you are mentioned here others in the baseball research community for discovering additional facts, statistics, and context that exceed the criteria used in 1969 to identify six major leagues. And for me, this statement is the kernel of, of the press release. 
It is Major League Baseball's view that the Special Baseball Records Committee 1969 omission of the Negro Leagues from consideration was clearly an error that demands today's designation. Uh, a, a wonderful statement falls just short of an apology, but uh, it, it really provides for me the raison d'etre for what they were about to announce. Okay, the first of three announcements, Major League Baseball officially declared the Negro Leagues as a major league. And you can see here on the left, this is what we were faced with when we went to bed on December 15th. Six major leagues, 279 seasons of baseball, over 220,000 major league games, and over 22,000 major league players. Overnight, this announcement created seven, not, not just one, seven different Negro leagues, more than doubling the number of leagues. 49 more seasons of baseball for all you trivia fans. Get ready for Baltimore because there's 49 more seasons that you need to know about. Over 12,000 additional games. And finally, per the press release, 3,400 players. I hope we do find 3,400. I want to interject one item that needs to happen to get to 3,400. Right now, it looks like about 1,900. If if the uh, implementing of the decision follows what was said in the press release. But the press release only addresses those seven leagues. Negro League Baseball was a different sort of animal. There's early Eastern activity in the 20s with Ildale, Atlantic City, the New York Lincoln Giants. There's the uh, Homestead Grays of 1930 and 1931, the Pittsburgh Crawfords of 1932. These are independent teams, and right now, they are not going to be considered major league. Okay, quick look. When we went to bed on the 15th, this was major league baseball, six leagues. When we woke up on the 16th, <laughs> 13 leagues. And you can see, of the, what is it, five, six leagues that lasted for more than a decade, three of them are Negro leagues. The second announcement, and the one that's probably the most fun and maybe the most complicated, was that Negro league statistics will become a part of Major League Baseball's history. This is where Elias comes in. Uh, and of course, they're working now closely with seam heads and I would assume baseball reference, since that seems to be the official repository of the statistics and baseball reference already does have a good number of Negro League stats taken from seam heads uh, on their website. All right, we're now we're gonna take a look at a few of the more interesting uh, possibilities or announcements or changes in historical views that occur because of uh, the stats becoming part of the record. This is what the segregated uh, batting leaders will look like in both batting average and home runs. Now, I have to be honest here. You won't find this on baseball reference at the moment. Baseball reference, rightly so, requires 3,000 plate appearances. Josh Gibson will never get the 3,000 plate appearances unless his time with the early Homestead Grays and the early Pittsburgh Crawfords are included, uh, and they were not in the league in 30 through 32. However, I, I, I put this up just to demonstrate what a wonderful player Josh Gibson must have been. I mean, we all knew he's the second Negro leaguer, the first position player put in the hall, but He's also second only to Ty Cobb in the history of the segregated game in, in batting average and second to Babe Ruth in home run rate during the segregated era. All that while catching more games than all but two Negro League catchers. Uh, some people think Josh would have been moved to first in the majors, and there's good reason to think so. But he wasn't moved to first in the Negro Leagues. Okay, here's another possibility. 
It's long been known that Willie Mays hit a home run with the Birmingham Black Barons in 1948. Now, to the best of my knowledge, but I'm not in that room, a box score has yet to be found. However, I think they're closing in on one. And if they find it, Willie Mays' home run total will jump from 660 to 661. Ted Williams, 1941, he hit 406. That's generally, well, it's not generally, that's the last major leaguer to hit 400 until last December 16th. These four batters, Tatilio Vargas, Josh Gibson, Bob Har Harvey, and Artie Wilson, all hit 400 for complete seasons in the Negro Leagues. I do want to bring your attention to the last column there, plate appearances per team game. And you'll see the major league requirement is 3.1. And I don't think that requirement's going to change. So that would probably eliminate Harvey and Wilson. Still leaves, of course, Vargas and Gibson. Vargas wins the 1943 batting championship, according to Seamheads. He only batted 136 times. Vargas could be the last 400 hitter. I prefer Josh Gibson. He bats half as much as Ted Williams. Uh, he finishes a little below Vargas. But with Gibson's 466, you have to look. What if he had 604 plate appearances like Williams? Well, a few, few pages before, we saw Gibson's lifetime average was 362. If he hits 334 in 302 more at-bats, he's going to hit 400. So I, I do feel there's a good argument for Gibson being the last of the 400 hitters and Williams being the last one to meet the 154-game qualification. We'll see uh, what Major League Baseball does with this. Here's another one. Joe Nuxall is the youngest Major League player ever to play, debuting in June 10th of 1944. Uh, he was 15 years old, I think 316 days. Uh, Roy Campanella, he debuted in the Negro Leagues in 1937. He only played six or seven games, but he turns the age of Nuxall on October 1st. So presuming he played at least one of those league games prior to October 1, he would become the youngest ever to appear in a major league game. I did find the earliest box score I can find occurs June 22nd. So that would make him the youngest, uh, unless someone else between 1920 and 1948 in the Negro Leagues was younger. And I, that's over my pay grade. Here's another one. And this, this is a thing of beauty for me. A as we delve into the social justice issues that need to be delved into, this is a brotherhood, and it's serendipitously tied between these two pitchers. That's Bob Fowler in the Navy. And the next to last year before the entry of the U.S. into World War II, he began with a no-hitter on opening day, the, the first major leaguer ever to do that. He was joined six years later by an Army man who had been drafted into the Army in the mid mid 40s, I think 43, and and served on, uh, I think it was Utah Beach. I'm, I'm not 100% sure of that, but he landed at Normandy on D-Day. So both these two guys were legitimate combat heroes. And the other guy, of course, I'm talking about is Leon Day and Michelle Freeman is in the room. I appreciate this wonderful picture. Leon is in the first row to my far right. He no hit the Philadelphia Stars on opening day of 1946, winning two to nothing. World Series no hitters. 30 years before Don Larson, Red Greer and Luther Farrell in back-to-back -back years for losing teams, not in the game, but in the series, they threw no hitters for the Atlantic City back rack Giants. Uh, Farrell's was actually on the anniversary day of Larson's, or vice versa. Finally, uh, the final record I want to talk about. This is my favorite player. In fact, his picture is right behind me. Uh, Rap Dixon in 1929 cracked 14 consecutive hits. 
He did this in four games on consecutive Sundays. The issue here, of course, is uh, did he play any games in between? I'm not aware of any league games that he played. I hope this passes muster. And that's what, uh, again, Major League Baseball, Elias, seam heads and baseball reference will be grappling with this and the other issues that I just mentioned. Okay, the third announcement, and this is where I hope to close, I'm way ahead of my time, so I might dwell a little bit on this last point. It is my thought today, after I'm finished, to take your questions and answers on my talk, but then I'm hoping that Peter and I are Peter or, or I can can lead a discussion with the, you guys in the audience about some of these issues and and some of the issues that weren't brought up uh, about Negro League being blended in to Major League history. But here is the, the the announcement that I would have loved to have heard last December. The Hall of Fame is going to induct induct additional Negro League players. Not, not one very well-deserving gentleman who should have been put in in 2006. I hope Buck O'Neill's going in. But let's take a look at some of these points. There are 166 players in the hall from the segregated era. Their careers began under segregation. 17% of them are Negro leaders. During the integrated era, Coincidentally, beginning with number 42, there are 42 uh, players of color that have been inducted out of 98. 43% of all Hall of Famers, beginning with Jackie to the present day, are players of color. Now, I'm not arguing, nor, nor would I think of arguing, that that 17% should increase to 43 Maybe it should increase to 50. It should increase to where it belongs. Uh, but clearly it should increase. Uh, it would take 73 more Negro League players to bring the 17% up to 43. And I can tell you, I know 73 Negro League players that are better than Lloyd, Lloyd Wainer or Rick Farrell or... or uh, Rabbit Moranville. Now, I'm not disparaging them except to say they are, they are among the lower tier Hall of Famers. I think they should be Hall of Famers. Uh, Rabbit Moranville was one of the more famous players in the game during his day. However, the same standard that was used to induct them should be used to induct Negro League players. I'm going to give you my choices, my eight, uh, and they are among players. And this is the order in terms of my preference. And that might surprise some of you that think I'm a blind Rap Dixon fan. But I like John Beckwith, Dick Blundy, Cannonball Dick Redding, Hurley McNair, Rap Dixon, George Scales, and then among the non-players, Gus Greenlee and Buck O'Neill. That'd be a good first step if those eight players are put in this December by the Hall. Okay, the last victims of the segregation of baseball prior to 1947 are us. I hope my little talk tonight and Major League Baseball's big move last December and the Hall of Fame's steadfast championing of the Negro Leagues for the past 60 years. Don't stop now, Cooperstown. But uh, I hope that they do uh, educate us all to where, unlike the players who can't shed their victimhood, but even though now they're shrouded with not as much glory as they deserve, but more glory than they've been given before, I hope we can learn more about the Negro Leagues, champion the deserving Hall of Famers, and, and bring those Negro League statistics into our daily, daily barroom discussions of who is the best and etc. So I think I'm done. So uh, 
let's do, if, if there's any questions for me, Peter, I'd like to do them. And then it's my hope, and you and I didn't talk much about this, but my hope all along was that I would shut up in time, and I think I did, uh, to have a discussion to the degree people are, are interested on the topic of the Negro Leagues as a major league. Okay, let people fire away, and uh, I'll just sit here and, and, and moderate. If you want to reach out to Ted uh, and ask a question or do it through the chat, um, we're a small enough group to let uh, everybody can, you know, we're all friends here, so uh, everybody <laughs> ahead. Should they raise their hand or something? Yeah, you can call them if, if they're uh, on video. Yeah. Or send a chat notice. Glenn, okay. got to unmute. There, now, can you hear me? Yes, I can, Glenn. Okay. First of all, I just wanted to say thank you, Ted. Thank you very much for uh, preparing this presentation and talking to us about it. Ever since the announcement was made, um, I've been turning over in my head, you know, what, you know, what it does mean and things like that. It was nice to see it put into perspective in a way that, that kind of makes sense and kind of answers some of the questions. Uh, obviously, as you pointed out, there are many questions that still need to be uh, answered. Um, and that's one of the great things about baseball and about what we do with baseball at Sabre is that we talk about these things. We, we, we not come to an answer we all agree on or, or that other people outside of Sabre agree to with us, but we talk about it. And that's one of the things that makes it an endlessly fascinating game. So thank you. You're welcome. You have a question? No, I didn't have a question uh, except for will the PowerPoint be available um, in some form or another? Because I'd like to make some notes off of what you had written. Uh, yes, it will. It, okay. It'll be up probably. Well, that's really for uh, Peter to answer, but typically it'll be up in about a week. Okay, great. Thank yeah, you very much. Usually Jacob puts it up within three to five days. Great. Thank you. Now, now, Peter, before we go any further, Michelle has a very good question, and I'm I'm sitting here struggling. Ah, there, there you go. And there I just answered Michelle's question. <laughs> Thanks. Thank you. But I do have a question. Um, great presentation, Ted. When you're watching like postseason baseball or regular baseball, and they're like, um, all the hoopla over Shohei Otani this season. How do we educate commentators? Because when they're throwing out all these statistics, they're not mentioning a Negro leaguer. So how do what's That's the right. next? What's the steps to get that information to them? Yeah, well, uh, well, that those shame on them because those statistics have been on Baseball Reference, not to the degree they're going to be for years now. Uh, and the two players that come to my mind, mostly, of course, Martin DeHigo and Bullet Joe Rogan, their stats were in the 2006 uh, Shades of Glory book. So uh, I, I don't know what the answer is. However, on the Internet, in some of the rooms, people do offer those two examples. And they point out that Babe Ruth, while a great player and a great two-way player, was for just a brief time, what Rogan was year in, year out, you know, for the bulk of his career. In other words, he pitched, or Rogan pitched and hit at the same time. As, you know, he was a position player when he wasn't pitching. And uh, unlike Ruth, who was pretty much a pitcher who became a hitter later, there was some overlap. <laughs> hey, Ruth, in fact, his, his locker's right behind me also. He's not to be disparaged either, but your point is well taken. I don't, I don't have an answer. Okay, thank you. 
Hey, Ted, uh, Tom Kern. Uh, I'm curious, I mean, we owe a significant debt of gratitude to seam heads for the work they've done. It has moved the needle in, in so many ways. Do you think, uh, and we're reminded that, that the stats that seam heads has collected embodies maybe what three quarters or so of the official gains at, at this juncture. Is MLB in a position to bring, well, they are, the resources that they have to bear to help bring those numbers up even further? Or are we just in a position where some of these figures, these box scores are just never going to be found? Well, now, again, that is a question I'm not privy to the answer to. Maybe some others in the room want to address it. But I do want to offer these points. Back in 2000, uh, I guess it was 2001, Major League Baseball did put up a quarter million to study the Negro Leagues with a predecessor group to seam heads. In fact, I wasn't going to let you just stop there. Before seam heads, there was the Negro League authors and researchers and authors group, which set the standard both for what type of stats were going to be kept and uh, set a good example that seam heads has rather diligently followed through on. And even, even the NL RAG was founded on the roots of the uh, Sabre Negro League Committee, which with Dick Clark and John Holloway and others put Negro League stats in the Big Mac in 1990. So that's how far back these stats have been coming. That's why Michelle's question is so is so on target because it's not like they haven't been there. It's, they've never been more complete than now, but it's 30 years since the Big Mac had Negro League stats. And uh, still you hear, when you hear Otani, you hear Ruth and Ruth alone. And I, I, I love me some Babe Ruth, but... Uh, I'd like to have the credit where credit's due. But Tom, so I, I, you're the same question as Michelle. I hope you're right. The point I was trying to make before I got too blabby was why not another quarter million or even better, another quarter million plus 20 years of inflation? You know, this is Major League Baseball is a billion dollar industry and uh, they did it 20 years ago. Let them do it again. In a quick follow-up, Michelle's point is so well taken that we don't see the, the, the conversation about baseball bringing in the richness of the Negro Leagues. And, 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 you know, Sean Gibson would say we shouldn't be studying Negro League baseball only in February, Black History Month. It should be throughout the year. And a few of us have come up with a dozen or 15 things that MLB could do to, to, to ensure that seamlessness, if you will, so that the citing of historical circumstances includes the Negro League players as well as those in the majors. And I wonder, is John Thorne our point of contact on that kind of thing? Well, I, I would think he would be. And John, uh, I invited him tonight and he wasn't sure if it was appropriate, but he will, uh, he will take a look at this. So any ideas you have, he'll be sure to see. And, uh, and John, I think, has been great on the issue of folding the Negro Leagues into the, into the Major League uh, record book. So, uh, you know, I, I, I think John is a Sabre member, and he's also the official historian of baseball. So he is a, uh, he's an I ideal candidate for such. So is, so is Tyrone Brooks of the commissioner's office. He's, I think, the diversity officer. Uh, he'd be another entree, and I, I'm sure Tyrone is a Sabre member. He's, uh, he's uh, attended a few Malloys. Thank you. Thanks. Jeff? I guess uh, when I look at baseball reference, uh, you mentioned the single season batting average leaders, and I noticed that Baseball Reference actually lists that Vargas as the all-time single season batting average. I just have a problem with comparing somebody with 136 plate appearances to somebody with 602. Yeah. You know, yeah. I don't mean to cause any problems here, but yeah. no. Well, I, I I referred to that, and I can understand that. Uh, that's why I 
I, to me, I'd suggest, although I like Josh Gibson better in 43 with twice as many at-bats, oh, yeah. Actually, but, but, but he's, a few, yeah, he's a few he's a few points Gibson behind. Second and third in that list. <laughs> yeah, but, but uh, the point I'm trying to make now, <laughs> now I've lost it a bit, but uh, Vargas would be considered if indeed he was the batting champion, he, he, he does have more than 3.1 at bat play appearances per game. Uh, if he is deemed by the powers that be, so be it. He's the highest average of a batting champion. However, I, I agree with you. Uh, I think it should be pointed out without an asterisk. <laughs> we don't like going there, but pointed out that uh, Ted Williams hit such when 600 plate appearances and I wouldn't ignore what Josh did that year. Josh hit a few points less in 300, but your point's well taken. And uh, have you heard, you ever heard of Bob Hazel? Do you know sure. Bob Hazel, Hurricane Hazel? Yes. He, he had more at bats than Vargas did. He had 403 that year in 1957. Yeah, but he when fell far short, far short of enough at bats. He didn't qualify for the batting race. Vargas, but, but he uh, had more than Vargas. That's, that's yeah, I, I'm not sure what the relevance of that is, but you're right. He did have more than Vargas. Glenn, uh, I I think one of the things that we have to take into account with uh, the diversity of those statistics is that the Negro Leagues weren't given the opportunity to play in the 162 or 154 game schedule. Uh, they were not given an opportunity to play against league competition uh, with the regularity that the uh, American and National League teams got to do because yeah. of the exclusion from the right. club. They could not yeah. play against the major league, the American and National League teams because of all of the Jim Crow right. laws. I do. I I, I do understand that, mm -hmm. but but you're also then assuming that they keep keep playing at the same level well, for the for the extra 400 at bats. That's yeah. right, and that's why I pointed out about Josh Gibson. If he just hits his average for the next 300, he hits 400. But even that's an assumption. <laughs> oh yes, yes, <laughs> yes. Here, here's okay. something that's here's something that's not an assumption. When blacks began to have a presence, particularly in the National League more than the American League, from the late 40s into the early 60s, black ball players won three quarters of the MVPs for the league. The sparing number that were permitted to play uh, performed well, uh, and that shows how they did. So the question might be as we struggle through this. If the Josh Gibsons, the Mule Suttles, the Turkey Sterns, the handful of greats in the 30s, which in some ways is something of a golden era for, for the Negro Leagues, what if they had been in the major leagues? Would Josh have won any MVPs? Uh, how, how would they have looked? And I think that's the, the fascinating struggle that we have as we try to make sense of all of this. Yeah. Yeah. And I'm sorry, Jeff, I, I, I understand where you're coming from. I'm a math major. It bothers me, too. However, the points that Glenn and Tom have made, uh, in my opinion, sort of override that. I didn't mean to go all school teacher on you. No, no, it's, well, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm, a, I was afraid I'd bring up, I'd cause a, a rift here, but yeah, I, I enjoy learning about these yeah. guys and everything. It, it's just, uh, Yep. Like uh, Ryan Mountcastle came, played in August and September, the 60 games last year, and hit 333. Yeah. There's no, yeah. you can't just add 400 bats to that and say he would have right. done the same thing of the season. And, and no one said that. Uh, but let's move on from that topic, okay. Jeff. I think okay. we beat That's it fine. to death. Uh, who else has a question? I hope. Go ahead. I, I just wanted to point out that that one of the things about baseball is that we have to have a very fluid way of thinking because we're comparing Rogers Hornsby's batting stats to Tony Gwynn's and Tony Gwynn paid, played in a much uh, more pitcher oriented game. Uh, so how do you compare them? And people have developed 
mathematical principles by which they attempt to void the difference in eras and things like that. And it's just another example of ways in which we'll have to be fluid about our thinking. Yes. But the points that everybody's making are valid. There's yes. none of the points are not valid, but how right. you incorporate them is going to be to some degree individual, but we also have to come to terms with the, how we talk about it amongst ourselves. Yes. Anybody else? Anything else you wanted to say, Jeff? Dad? Uh, oh, Gary? Yeah. Did you, didn't you ask who was missing from that photograph or from that press release and not answer the question? I think you're right. Uh, I, 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 haven't, I, I haven't looked at the chat. I hope some people answered that question. Did, did they? Well, I typed oh. in two ideas. Okay. Gary Ashwell and the four living Negro League players, if they could have. Okay. Well, let, let's take them one at a time there. Gary was there, although not a speaking part. Seamheads got very good notice. Uh, but, you know, you're right. Gary could have had a speaking part yeah, or Sean have. Foreman. Yeah, Sean Foreman could have also from baseball reference. Uh, and you, your other group, there were four living Negro League players that I don't know that they were even were referred to in that press release, but they, you know, they could, I, I've heard Mr. Teasley speak on the issue uh, since uh, I'm not sure about Mr. Golden, uh, Mr. Greason or Mr. Mays. But yes, there are other, yeah. but the, the answer to the question from my perspective was the Baseball Hall of Fame. And I was hoping. Uh, good point. <laughs> yeah, I was hoping, and I guess it's my, my speaking lackings. Uh, I, I wanted people to say that. <laughs> it sounds like they might not have. Uh, but the Baseball Hall of Fame has been silent since December as to what they're going to do. Now, they do have their guidelines up. They've been up for five years. And until the major leagues declared the Negro Leagues a major league, according to the guidelines, the Negro Leaguers were not eligible. Now, according to their press release five years ago, they were going to be. But it just shows you how far the Hall of Fame has slipped on this issue. And I, I urge them to, uh, to get back on board the train. Right, I agree with you that the um, the hall really hasn't addressed substantively the election of Negro leaders since 2006, since, uh, let's say, unwisely, I have another word for it, but let's say unwisely then declaring there would never be another election while they're continuing to put in old white guys. Uh -huh. From the same era, right. Well, from the same era and from even earlier, from the 19th <laughs> yes. century. Yes, yes. Who's on the committee? Uh Ted, who's on the committee uh, to be responsible for this? Uh, well, I, I stopped sharing my screen and I don't want to go back there. But the committee is it going to have 16 people on it. It has yet to be announced. I was told by the hall just this week. I, I did try to get some cutting information for this presentation and failed from, from all of the people involved. But uh, 16 people will be on the committee. Uh, there will be, and it, this sort of changes, there, I'd say between four and eight are going to be Hall of Famers themselves. What they know about pre-1950 baseball, <laughs> I don't know. But So that's eight voters that are going to be easily manipulated by someone of, who can or are going to be relatively ignorant about you know, the, the discussion. The other eight will be split between writers. And I hope Claire Smith is on that committee. She has been in the past, but she's been a, a BWAA member in the past. I'm not sure if she still holds that card. I, I, I don't know because she's no longer a journalist. Now she's in uh, education academics at Temple University. So that's what the group is made up of. Writers, executive types, and Hall of Fame players. You got to get 12 of those 16 votes to get in. And these people are only allowed to vote for four candidates to be inducted. 
that applies to the 1950 through 70 group also. Uh, that's why I'm not so confident about Dick Allen or Gil Hodges. I'm not a big Hodges man, but many are. Uh, it, it, the, these panels, by even without anything surreptitious in the background, uh, the panels are designed to make it very difficult, as it should be. This is the Hall of Fame. Like Jeff says, he's for the small hall. And frankly, I like a small hall too. But the small hall uh, needs about 200 players before 1950. Peter? Have uh, questions or comments for Ted? We had a good group tonight. A lot of faces I haven't seen in a while, so thank you all for coming. Thank you, Peter. Anybody else? Stephen, you just lit up. Nothing? <laughs> oh, I, I, I do want to say something. I noticed Scott Morris is in the audience. Scott is a movie producer who did a wonderful movie about the Harrisburg Giants. Uh, if you if you get a chance, check it out. Uh, he's got a, a Facebook page, and uh, he, he he should add in the chat room the name of the movie because I guess it's their word Giants, and it's a marvelous story about the 1954 Harrisburg Giants, but it also discusses a bit the great Rap Dixon. Thanks for coming, Scott. Good job, Ted. I'm, uh, like again, I'm gonna apologize for this delayed a week, but uh, I'm glad uh, we were able to, to, to fit it in and, uh, and get it in since it's already October. You can believe that. So it's been 10 months since the announcement. Um, and in another 10 months, we'll have the convention here in Baltimore Got yeah. um, and uh, hopefully all of you guys will be will be present in what is sure to be the largest saber convention uh, in history today. So, OK, Peter, and I have to add something now that you bring that up. I certainly hope to be there in Baltimore. But in Birmingham, two months before that will be our next Malloy conference. And I I want to put out a special invite to Jeff. Uh, I'll be I'll be going down to Birmingham in some way, driving right through uh, your neck of the woods. Oh, right. <laughs> I might uh, hop on with you guys too. It's worth the trip. Oh, Peter, is it? Is that who said that? I. Yeah. Okay. I, I'm going to consider. Oh, Glenn. Going yeah, too. yeah. Glenn makes perfect sense. He's actually been to a couple of Malloys. I got recruited yeah. into Sabre by Dick Clark and, and Ted Knorr at a Jerry Malloy conference up in Harrisburg. Oh, oh, really? Wow. That was the first one. Wow. That was the first one I'd ever been to. I wasn't a member yet, but you invited me up and that actually had me do a presentation. And uh, it was, I had a wonderful time. Yes. Is that yes. like the same, the same format as the National Convention? You have rooms with presentations? Yes. It, uh, the, the difference is it's about uh, you know, it's uh, much smaller, maybe 100 attendees. It's, it's a family. Michelle can attest to that. I'm looking right now. Gary has been to some. Glenn, uh, I, I don't know if there's anyone else in the room that has been to a Malloy, but they are a, a family affair. Well, hopefully 2022, um, which isn't that far off, is much more uh, full of uh, abundance and blessings for everyone here, um, Saber community. And, and, you know, I believe that the first they're going to do the, um, the analytics conference first in March, they're gonna to try to do that in person. Oh, wow. And then Malloy in June and then the national um, in August. So um, hopefully somewhere along the line, uh, I'll see you guys. Um, if not at Malloy, then hopefully here uh, mid-August of next year so and I have no excuse not to go I live in blocks from the Hyatt so um, thank you Peter absolutely um, well like I said this 
presentation will likely be up. Uh, Jacob's pretty darn good at what he does. Um, so usually three to five days, it'll be on the, the Sabre site with the link to the YouTube page um, for anyone who's missed, missed it and wants to share it with, uh, with others. Um, yeah. And uh, hopefully we'll see you guys. We have uh, more presentations this month. Well, one more presentation and then our uh, babble at the end of the month, which is actually on Halloween. Um, two in November and one in December. Um, we have next month, we have Jeff Arnold uh, in November during the call shot lunch. He's one of the Orioles broadcasters and we're gonna have the voice of the Orioles, the public address and answer, Adrian Roberson. <laughs> Wonderful young lady. Um, she's actually originally from Philadelphia. Uh, and I don't know anything about Orioles Fan Fests or anything like that at this point. So um, I haven't heard a, heard a peep. So who knows with I think, COVID? I think, they and, stopped, and, I think they stopped having the best team before COVID. That's oh, true. Man. They did that caravan thing, but I haven't heard, heard any, you know, they're doing any little things. So, um, but, uh, you know, stay tuned to our Facebook page. Uh, obviously, you guys are on our email lists. Um, and on our chapter rosters. So we'll keep you informed uh, as best we can with the upcoming events. So again, Ted, thank you from, from uh, being from my home state in Pennsylvania. Um, uh, hopefully we'll see you guys all again soon. And uh, I'm here if you need anything. So reach out anytime. Thank you. All right, guys, have a good evening. Okay. Thanks, Ted. Take care. All right, thank you. Thanks, Ted.